Sanjay, uh, so what's your analysis based on everything we know? Could the, the vaccine uh, that all of us have been waiting for, could it be possible that it will come over the next several months? Yeah, Wolf, I think that there's nothing in this first peer-reviewed uh, study now of a U.S. vaccine candidate. There's nothing in the study to suggest that anything has derailed, uh, but it's still very early days, Wolf, very early days. Uh, let me just tell you a couple things about this. Uh, they, they basically gave a dose of the vaccine to 45 healthy individuals between the ages of 18 and 55, and then they gave a second dose about a month later, about 28 days later. So remember that this is a two dose vaccine that they're looking at here to try and get the, the, the response that they're hoping for. Uh, it seemed relatively safe, meaning that there were no significant side effects that actually stopped the trial. But let me show you, if I can, just some of the side effects that they did see. And uh, they gave this medication at different dosings, uh, at, at, the, at the sort of middle dose and the higher dose. Uh, basically, everybody who got the, the vaccine did have some sort of side effect. Some people had more than one side effect. Uh, they appeared to be transient. They went away. But again, Wolf, uh, these side effects are something that they're going to be paying attention to, and this was in 45 healthy people between the ages of 18 and 55. The whole process, Wolf, is, is going fast. Uh, they, they're through phase one. They're, they're going to be starting phase three at the end of this month. Typically, that takes years to get to that point, and they've obviously done that in months. The big question, Wolf, does it work, right? Is it actually going to provide protection uh, so that people don't get infected with this virus? And we don't, we don't know the answer to that yet. It, it, this, this vaccine did appear to make antibodies in the people that it was given to, uh, but how well those antibodies will work, uh, we have to wait and see by these other trials. There, there's a thing, Wolf, uh, you know, you'd love to have some sort of correlate measure when you do these trials. Like I'd love to measure something in inches or pounds or meters. Unfortunately, we don't have that. So I can't tell you this is, works X amount well yet. The only way to really know that is to study this in larger and larger groups of people and see if, in fact, it protects them. So that's basically what they're going to be doing now over the next uh, several months, Wolf, again, starting at the end of this month to really find out, A, it looks like it, it seems to be generally safe. Let's make sure it stays safe in older people and people who have pre-existing conditions. And let's also make sure it works, yeah. it actually protects people against the infection, Wolf. I want to ask you about this, Sanjay, because this is potentially troubling news. There's a new study that finds that a person's coronavirus antibodies, after they have already been exposed to the disease and they've developed antibodies, that those antibodies start to decline somewhere 20 to 30 days after they first show symptoms. Does that mean if somebody's antibodies can decline and ultimately even possibly go away, does that mean that people can get this illness more than once? Well, you know, the, I, I think the answer to that question for the time being is, you know, we, we don't know for sure. I will say this, Jake, and we follow this very closely, We've been doing a lot of reporting in this area. You know, at this point in the middle of July, we, we haven't seen a, a case reports of people becoming reinfected in this country. Okay. There was some discussion about that in South Korea. That was probably not actually true reinfections. If it were true that the antibodies and protection were only lasting 20 to 30 days, I think we would have start, started to see some significant amounts of reinfection. We haven't. Number two is that, you know, the, the idea that people who have minimal symptoms versus people who have significant symptoms, they do seem to have different amounts of antibodies that they're producing. This is borne out in two studies, one out of China, one out of Italy now. So people who are relatively asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic may be producing less antibodies and maybe possibly less strong antibodies as well. Again, the data is still coming in on this, so we'll have to, we'll have to see about that. I think that the, the big question going forward is, is you know, how protective is it ultimately if you, if you get exposed to this virus? And I think the answer is still that it, you do have some protection for a period of time. It may not be the antibody specifically, it may be these other cells that quickly turn on in the body to make antibodies when you're exposed to the virus. We don't know yet, but I do believe, Jake, based on all reporting, that at least for a period of time, you do have protection after you've been exposed to this virus. COVID-19 is thought to spread mainly through close contact from person to person, but the CDC says some people without symptoms may be able to spread the virus.
A recent report in the CDC's Emerging Infectious Diseases Journal shows as many as half of the residents infected with coronavirus in long-term care facilities in Pasadena, California, had no symptoms, and a quarter of the infected staff were also asymptomatic. The team looked at nine long-term care facilities in the city and determined asymptomatic infection rate among staff on average was one out of every four and one in two among residents. They found female nursing home residents had higher rates of asymptomatic infection than male residents and say because the potential for asymptomatic transmission is concerning, infection control efforts in long-term care facilities should include both mass testing and symptom screening. For today's Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. Mm -hmm.